This is Health and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Dora Caro, and I'm also your guest, Dr. Robert Schwartz. <laughs> oh my God, I think this is amazing. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I grew up in Montreal. Oh, wow. in Canada. And I lived there until I went to college and I grew up wanting to be a physicist. That was, well, not always, but when I got older, I wasn't as a toddler, I didn't want to be a physicist. And I decided um, in college for a lot of reasons that that wasn't going to be what I wanted to do. I decided junior year in college to go into medical school. I thought I was going to go to med school to be a neurosurgeon, but when I started studying it and watching the surgeons, I realized I don't want to do this. So, uh, um, and I became interested in plastic surgery and that's when I did a general surgery residency first and got board certified in general surgery because that was sort of the way you did it then. They didn't really have very many of the programs where you could go straight from med school into plastic surgery. Oh, is there such a thing now? Oh yeah. That's, the, that's most of them now. So it shaves off a couple of years, which would have been nice at the time. How many but, years would it save? Uh, would have saved me, I think, three, because I did six years of general surgery because I did a year of research as well. Okay. And then I did two years of plastic surgery. So it was eight years after medical school. And I think the programs now are about five. So, so after someone owes school. me three years somewhere. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. After high school, how many years would it take to become a plastic surgeon? So, well, now it would be, you'd have four years of med school and five years of residency training that would combine some general surgery and mostly plastic surgery. So nine years, right? So, wow. Yeah, nine. So for me though, because I did the six years of general, two years of plastics, that's eight and then four, so it's 12. Wow. Yeah. After 12 yeah. Yeah. from... Yeah. After high school. Wow. Uh, after college, I should say. 12 after college. So how many years in college? Four. Oh my so goodness. So wait, is this right? I think by my calculations, I should have finished my training and immediately retired. <laughs> <laughs> I, think I, I think I finished, I was old enough to be on Medicare. But yeah, 16 years. Wow. 16 years, yeah. Wow. Do you see a problem with uh, some doctors? There's few states where doctors just graduate from medical school and start practicing plastic surgery. I think that, well, legally, I think it's everywhere you can do that. Oh, really? I think, um, well, definitely in Texas and every state I'm aware of, you need to do four years of medical school. You need to do at least one year of internship of actual sort of work in a hospital. Okay. And then you're licensed to practice medicine. And when you're licensed to practice medicine, you can do anything in medicine. So wow. theoretically, I could do open heart surgery. Never really been trained in it. Don't, probably wouldn't do it very well, wow. but I could legally do it. The thing that limits you from doing that is in most cases, at least most areas of surgery, you have to have hospital privileges because most surgeries of that kind need to be done in a hospital and hospitals won't give you privileges if you're not properly trained. Okay. The problem in cosmetic surgery is more of it is done, not much of it is done in the hospitals. Most of it's done in either outpatient surgery centers or in people's own offices. You know, a lot of these places will give privileges to anyone. And so you do have people doing cosmetic surgery who are not trained at all or very inadequately trained. Wow. The surgeries are trickier than they look. Right? Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because when you, we talk about, um, for example, chin lipo. Right. That looks very, very simple. But I have seen in my office many complications. Yep. I mean, I don't do surgeries, but when they come for the, their post-op care, I see a lot of things. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, yeah, you have, look, the unique advantage of seeing good, bad, otherwise, right? You see, you see the range of what can be done in something as simple as chin liposuction. Right. Liposuction really kind of lends itself to untrained people doing bad surgery because the problem with liposuction is that it looks deceptively simple. It looks very like a, like you could train a, a monkey to do it because you make a little incision, right? And what are you doing? You're passing a, a metal rod through the fat that's hooked up to suction and sucking the fat out. It seems very simple. It doesn't require a lot of fine dexterity. You don't have to have, you know, super great motor skills. You don't have the great hands or anything. It's just mostly gross movements with your hands. The hard part about it is knowing what to take and what not to take. And 
what your endpoint is and knowing what it's supposed to look like and also knowing how to guide the cannula, the metal rod properly, so you don't do damage. Yeah, this is an area there's not much to take in most people, but right behind that fat are a lot of things that can't get damaged if you want your patient to live. You know, you're only this far away from their trachea, from their esophagus, from their carotid, you know, things that if you damage that, that's going to end very badly. And so the problem is a lot of people doing these procedures aren't trained to do it. Many of them aren't even trained as surgeons. They don't know the anatomy and you're likely to get into situations that are really problematic doing that. I had a customer that part of her face was paralyzed. Permanently? Well, she came right after surgery, yeah. which um, in these cases, I prefer not to take the patients. When I say there's too many complications, I don't want to be liable for anything. Right. So I send them back to their surgeon and especially this patient, a dentist perform her lipo. You know, it always amazes me when I hear these stories about people going to just bizarre places to get mm -hmm. cosmetic surgery done. I have to I have to wonder how that conversation even starts. Like you're there for a, get your teeth cleaned and they go, "Well, you know, I can also do liposuction on you." You think most people would be? No, nah, that's okay. Just let's stick with the teeth cleaning. We'll right. Go. Yeah. It would. It would be like me. You know. Hey, while we're doing your tummy tuck, why don't I take out your gallbladder? It would. Although that would make more sense because I'm actually trained to take out gallbladders. I've done it. And it's already but it's still everything crazy, else. Then? But it's still. But it's still crazy. Yeah. And sometimes I even ask. Maybe it's because of the price. Like, okay, yeah. maybe it's way affordable if you do it with the dentist. Maybe. And no. It no. wasn't. It wasn't the case. It was average. Yeah. Even look. Even if it was inexpensive, there are just some things in life. It's not a good idea to economize on, right? There's certain places where you know. There's certain things. If you're going to like, uh, I don't know, you're trying a new restaurant and you have a coupon or something, that's fine. Your facial surgery, probably not. Probably not a great idea to save money there. Right. You save up the extra money, get it done properly, save the money on something else. That's exactly what I say in my videos. Yeah. Like, plastic surgery is no something that you need. It's something that you want. So save enough money, not only yeah. for the surgery, but for the post-op care. Meaning, some people believe they get the surgery today, tomorrow they can go back to work. Because that's what many surgeons advertise. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Yep. The recovery is super quick and yep. they don't understand the trauma that that's going to, you know, their body is going to go through. Yep. And then they feel they need to go back to work because they already spent all the savings in the surgery itself. When to me, the surgery is only 50% of the investment. Garments, creams, your their skin is going to go through a lot. Taking care of the children, like there is many things that they have to prepare for. What do you say to your customers after, like, oh, before the surgery? Well, we always try to give everyone um, as realistic an assessment, and I try to give conservative assessments of when they can resume their various activities. So yeah, I don't have a whole lot of respect for surgeons who use exaggeration about the recovery as a marketing tool. So there are surgeons who will tell you, oh, we encourage our patients to go out to dinner and go dancing the night after their breast augmentation. Really? You can get away with it. You know, not many people are really going to want to do that. Okay. In fact, no one really wants to do it, but it's a marketing gimmick. It's making people feel and discount that what they're having done is a real surgery. And when you do that, the first problem is if you don't seem to be taking the surgery that seriously, then your patient isn't going to take the recovery that seriously. That's a problem because in my experience, most of the problems that people get into aren't necessarily with the surgery itself. It's with the recovery process and doing too much too soon and, you know, getting ahead of themselves on things. And so the truth is most cosmetic surgeries aren't that hard to recover from. They're much easier than most people think they are. So our typical surgery, there are exceptions, but our typical surgery, most patients are up and around the next day, mostly able to take care of themselves. Within a few days, they're not having much in the way of pain, so it's easy. But the problem with that is, because the techniques are so good and people aren't necessarily hurting that much, is they start to feel, I'm better, I'm recovered, I can just go on and do everything. And that's where you start to have problems. So we're always 
First of all, giving our patients very careful estimates when you can return to work, when it would be safe to drive, when you can start exercising again, which isn't necessarily that far out. Most of our patients start going back to the gym in three weeks after most surgeries. So it's not that long a time, but it's not immediate. The other thing that we find we have to do now because people are feeling better sooner and because everyone in our society is constantly on the go, 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 go. Yeah. We have this in ways that I don't remember seeing even 10 years ago, people who like can't sit still. We have to constantly remind our patients, hey, 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 I know you're feeling good. You're still recovering. There are things to do and things not to do at this point. And if we want to have an uneventful recovery with the best possible results, we got to take care of your recovery too. Yes. Something that you mentioned is the go, go, go. Yeah. But in reality, sometimes, for example, a tummy talk, even though they have the energy to stand up, there is things that need to heal. Yep. What do you think yeah. about that? Well, it's interesting. It's interesting you said that because you hit on exactly what I was sort of um, vaguely referring to, how some surgeries take longer to recover. The tummy tuck is one of those. So our usual parameters for most people are, for people with office jobs, most of our surgeries, they can return to work in about four to seven days. Um, most cases, they can return to working out in about three weeks. For tummy tucks, we double all of those. So for most people going back to work for office jobs, it's about seven to 10 days. And for going back to working out, it's about six weeks. And the reason is part of a tummy tuck is lacing up the muscles internally to flatten out the tummy. When the tummy tuck is first completed, the only thing holding that all together internally is the stitches that we put in, which are strong, but in fact, they're stronger than the abdominal wall tissue itself. But if you do too much too soon, you will tear them out. And if you do that, you may create bulges in the uh, in the abdomen. Yeah, which you don't want to do. Yes. Which, unfortunately, if we need to go back and fix that, it requires redoing the whole tummy tuck. Wow. It's not worth it. It's just not worth it. And so we're always reminding our patients, don't do too much too soon. This is what you can lift. This is what you can't lift. Now you can do this. We see our, our patients very frequently after surgery so that we can be in touch with them and letting them know, okay, this is where you are. Remember, just because it feels fine right now, it's going to take weeks and weeks and weeks for all those areas we sewed together internally to gain strength and hold themselves together even if the stitches weren't there. You're not there yet. That's about a six week process for that to happen. And this is something I like a lot about your practice that you actually see your patients. Yeah. Like they feel safe. Like, yeah, I can call my surgeon and he's going to answer and he's going to yeah. see me today if he needs to see me. And that's not every case. As you know, no. I take customers from everywhere. And sometimes I need to send uh, the report. I report back to their surgeons, never get a a reply. I ask my customers, did they call you? No, nobody calls. It's like, there is no many surgeons that actually care about the, their patients, their patients. And, um, you do it. And I yeah. love that about your practice. Well, I hope that's not true about most surgeons, but I know that, I know, that, I know that we do. And so I'm very easily reachable by my patients after surgery. I do almost every follow-up appointment myself. There are times where we have scheduling conflicts or later appointments, you know, that um, further out in the healing process where there's nothing um, major going on, but almost every single follow-up appointment I'm present for. Um, after hours, if my patients need something and they call, they get me. So I, I'm readily accessible. I want to see them. I want to stay in touch. I think it's just, look, we're providing, yeah, we're providing healthcare, but at some level we're providing a luxury service. It just is, you know, it's one it thing, is. you know, it's one thing if you're going in and getting your appendix taken out, you're getting surgery for a specific health related purpose. And we all know from our experiences and having those kind of healthcare treatments, at least the way the healthcare system is in this country now, service is not one of their priorities. But when we're doing this, people are paying for an excellent result. They're also paying for a service and a quality service. So we try to be really attentive to that in my practice and the way we interact with everyone and the way we make it easy to reach us and the way we stay in touch with them. Yeah, I love it. And I love the way he does consultations. Uh, I went with my friend to a consultation with him and actually I love how sincere you are and how straightforward and just picture this when you are uncomfortable about a specific area in your body you're yeah. already fragile yeah and you were very gentle yeah. yes I came up with the word <laughs> Good. Oh, you speak yeah. Spanish. I see. I understand. I knew what you were getting at, though. Okay. Yeah. So you were very gentle. Thank you. The way you deliver the information. And and I think you are yeah. very, very... Guys, go with him. 
Thank you. Thank you. Well, look, I, I, look, I think this is really important. And I, it's, um, I think when you think about what are we really accomplishing in these surgeries, the real point of this surgery, everyone who comes to see me is coming to talk to me and show me the part of their body they like or face, whatever, that they like the least, that they're the most self-conscious about, that they're the least confident about, right? And so I think it's on us in our practice to be sensitive about this, to acknowledge it, to appreciate their honesty and their openness in revealing this. Because this is not, people don't go to each other and go like, hey, I hate my breasts. You got to see this. Look how bad. No one does that, right? Yeah. So they're showing me something that very often they're showing me a part of their body and their husband is in the room and the husband doesn't see it anymore because the, this is very common. Their woman's like, oh no, I only change with the lights and I don't want him to see me. Or they make their husband leave the room because they don't want their husband to see this part of their body. The guy, the husband hasn't seen it in years. Wow. And so they're giving me a trust and a responsibility here. So one, we want to be sensitive about it and we want to be courteous about it. And we want to point out that the real purpose of this surgery, it may be to make the breasts bigger or suck out some fat or something or other, but the real purpose of the surgery is to take a part of their body that they don't feel good about, that they don't want to show anyone and ideally make them proud of it. That's really what we're doing here is we're taking one problem in their life, maybe one very limited problem and solving it. That's part of it. Then the other part of it is that, and I don't know that this was always true in my practice, but certainly in the last 10 to 15 years, most women are beaten down by what society tells them about themselves and how they look. And I can't tell you at least once a week and probably a lot more than that, I have to tell someone seeing me for a consultation, that they're so much better looking than they think they are. Seriously, because... So you turn customers? I don't necessarily turn them down. I try to... Um, it doesn't mean they're wrong. So in other words... Say the truth, that, because you say no to me. What? Well... Be honest. I do, no. I do sometimes. I do sometimes turn people down. Not necessarily because of this. So it, it's sort of a... I guess it's sort of a spectrum. So... My point is, is that we'll use the example of say breast implants again, okay? Or a breast lift, this commonly comes up. So yes, yeah, someone comes in, they may need a breast lift, the breasts have sagged a little bit, we're gonna raise them up, we're gonna do all these things. But I can't tell you the number of times where we go to do the exam and I'm doing the measurements and the woman is just mortified. She's like, I know these are probably the worst you've ever seen. and. It never is. Um, I, I'm like, listen, okay, there are things we can do here. We should do this. This is a good idea. I think you're going to like this because we do this and this. But if you never have surgery with me or with anyone else, just know there's nothing terrible about your breasts right now. This thing that you think that's going on that you think is a horror show is not. They're normal. They're pretty much in line with women your age who've had kids or whatever. I go... And if you think you're the worst I've seen, you're not in the top 1,000. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a list you don't want to be on. So I'm constantly now telling people that, yes, what you see is real. It's not nearly as bad as you think it is, though. You're much better looking than you think you are. Yeah. So, because yeah. again, the purpose of this is, and I'm not lying to them. I'm telling this sincerely. I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't tell someone that, oh, you look great when you don't look great. That's not my job. But my job is also not to have them leave my office, whether they have surgery or not, feeling even worse about themselves than when they came in. Exactly. And I, I do weight loss in, in my office as well. And I hear that all the time. Yeah. Like when they are actually already basically naked, they're like, oh, I'm, I'm so yeah. embarrassed. This is, I look horrible. I'm like, yeah. no, you don't. But we are so used to looking at Instagram models, yep. and they look so perfect, perfect skin, perfect right. everything. And I have um, um, Instagram models as patients, and yeah. they look completely different than what you see on Instagram. Yeah. And it's something that we have to keep reminding our patients, like what you see there is not real. It's not real. There is a lot of Photoshop. There is a lot of makeup, filters. Yeah. And then regular people like myself, are competing with something that is even real. Right. Well, and start with just the simple fact that whatever you're seeing on Instagram is the result of several hundred photos being taken and someone selecting the very best one and then spending hours working on that. Correct. It's, it's very hard. Yeah. Some of these people spend more time filtering their photos than it takes to do the surgery to actually make them look that way. <laughs> right. That's 
<laughs> That's not even fair. Yeah. It's a very, I definitely see an aspect of that in my practice and it's definitely changed in the last 10 years and how- Social media. Yeah. It's, ha it's changed how unforgiving people are of themselves. Wow. What is your favorite surgery? What do you like to do the most? Um, well, a big part of what I do is revisions of people's previous surgeries that didn't turn out so well somewhere else. So I like doing those. Um, a lot of that on breasts and tummies, body contouring revisions. And I like doing those because they're always different. So every case is a little bit different. It's a little bit interesting. It's a little bit of problem solving. So I love doing those, but my biggest specialty in my practice is doing combination procedures on breasts and body. So mommy, what people call mommy makeovers, but we'll do, you know, all kinds of comprehensive packages of 360 degrees of the breast, the abdomen, all that sort of thing. So it's more common for me to do multiple procedures on someone than to do a single procedure. Almost no one comes in anymore just wanting one thing. It happens, but not nearly as often. Really? Yeah. Something that you talked about earlier about technology. Yeah. So there's a subject that not many people know about. So I can tell what type of technology the surgeon used on each patient, seeing all the, the side effects. Yeah. that were provided to the skin, that were done to the entire body. And that's something that you do. You have a lot of technology, like new technology. Yep. Can you tell us about it? Well, we do, well, for, I'll give you an example. Um, in liposuction, we do a combination technology on that. And so, and I do it, my reasoning on this is very simple. Okay, liposuction, great results in liposuction come down in almost all cases to getting the most fat out in the most even way possible. It's very rare. So remember, I just said that I like to do correction surgeries of surgeries that someone had that didn't go well. Liposuction is very different from everything else in that that regard. Almost everything that you have to go to correct as a revision surgeon is the previous surgeon did too much. Implants that are too big or a tummy that's pulled too tight or a face that's pulled too tight, all of those things. Liposuction is the only one where that's almost never the case. Liposuction, when it needs to be corrected, it's almost always that they didn't take enough. There are exceptions, but mostly when I'm looking at a liposuction where someone didn't like their results, I'm looking at something where, yeah, there's more fat to take here. It's not, you're not getting the good results. Or they took a little too much here, a little too little there, and you even it out by taking a little more in the places where fat was left behind. So we focus on the things in liposuction that lead to a better result, which is getting that fat out, getting as much of it out as we can and getting it out in the most even way possible. So I do two things. I use a vaser first, which is basically an ultrasound system where you pass an ultrasound rod through the fat, through the same incision that you would suck it out with. That softens and liquefies the fat. The ultrasound is tuned so it breaks up the fat cells, but nothing else. And then we go in with a device called a Vibrosat, which is made by a German company called Moller, which is a liposuction machine, but the tip of it vibrates very rapidly. Wow. So there are a number of systems that do this. this. I've looked at all of them. I think this is the nicest one. It seems to get the best results. And so it's less trauma. It's less trauma because with between using the vaser and the Vibrosat, there's none of that. If you watch liposuction videos, it looks violent on yes. most of them because you have to use force because you're taking a metal rod and passing it through solid fat. With the vaser, it's already not solid fat. And then with the Vibrosat, the vibration is doing most of the work for us. So everything just glides through. So that's less trauma. Less trauma means less bruising, less swelling, less pain, which are all very good things, okay? But the main thing is using those two in that combination, the way we do it, gets more fat out and it gets it out evenly. And so you get better results, you get more dramatic results and you get prettier results. So. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we have the next room, as you yes. said. Yeah, so there we go. Yeah, so, yeah. Because that's another thing about liposuction too. Is there's a lot of people who do it, um, not in an OR, not in a real OR, and very often uh, with the patient awake, which is doable, and we do that for smaller areas of liposuction. But really, if you want to get the best results with liposuction, you need to be asleep. And the reason is, is if you try to inject the fat to get it all numb, you will always miss spots. If you pick any area of fat on your body, it's a complex three-dimensional shape. It's very hard to get it completely numb. And so if you're doing it on someone who's awake and you're doing a limited area, yeah, if you miss a, if there's an area, they go, oh, you inject a little more. Oh my God. But you can't do that over 360 degrees of your abdomen, your thighs. First of all, you can't put in that much local because it's too much 
One. You'll overdose on that. So you can't do that. So what surgeons ends up, end up doing when they do large liposuctions on patients who are awake is they do one of two things. They either kind of power through and the patient, as the patient screams because it's hurting, which I, I don't want to do that. That's, no. That sounds it's a bad dramatic. day for them, bad day yeah. for me. I don't want to do it. Or the more common thing they do, because most surgeons are torturers, right? So they skip that the area. Butchers? They just they just bypass they just bypass that area, right? So they just Ooh. intentionally just go. Okay, fine, it's hurting there. We'll go around it, right? Well, the problem with that is is that, like we said, with liposuction, the thing you want to do is get the most fat out. If you're intentionally skipping areas, you're intentionally leaving fat behind. That compromises your results. So really, unless you're doing a very limited area of liposuction, you want to be asleep to get the best result. Well, like the entire thing is it's really scary. If you are awake, it means that you can hear all the machines that are around yep, you. Yep. I, I you know, there's there are surgeons who sell all kinds of awake procedures, um, awake breast augmentation, which again we do if someone really wants it, but I discourage people from doing it because again it sounds very traumatic. I think it is. I think it is. I don't I don't know why anyone would want to be awake. I think I know why they want to be awake because they've been told that general anesthesia is very dangerous. It's not. If it's administered by a trained anesthesiologist in a true OR, which we have, um, under the right settings, in a healthy person. I do my surgeries. We have our own operating room. We have our own recovery. We have everything set up there just like it, you would be in a surgery center. If someone is going to be at too great a risk for general anesthesia, and it's a surgery you want to do under general anesthesia, I don't do those. I will tell someone. You might be a candidate for having this done in a hospital because of all of your health concerns. You know, there are people who come in and they have a lot of health issues. Those people aren't candidates for having something done outside of a hospital. So um, in this in these cases where their health is, is not cooperating with the surgery, what do you do? 